This is Annabelle Gaberti and you are listening to Lawfully Creative, my chance to talk with professionals in the creative industries, to hear their stories, what inspires their creation, what decisions changed their careers, what relationships influenced their work. Today's episode is brought to you by Quifovi, our London and Paris-based law firm focused on advising the creative industries. Subscribe to our podcast Lawfully Creative or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube and SoundCloud. As you may know, my practice in the creative industries as a, as a lawyer for creatives has driven me towards fashion people and I attend probably six times a year fashion trade shows in particular in Paris, in particular also at um, fashion trade shows such as Tronoy, Man and also Woman, Capsule. While I'm there, I meet a lot of fashion designers, prospects, clients. I also see what the trends are in the market, whether the fashion industry is doing well. I listen to what the market has to say, really, and I make contacts. Through these attendance to um, the Tronoi trade shows, I met various Russian designers, in particular designers who were working with fur, with a lot of fur and doing some delightful hats and um, other garments and accessories out of fur. And through these uh, Russian fashion designers working mainly with fur, I met a uh, fur trader, Natasha Korol, and I decided to catch up with her in London because that's where she lives in order to sit down and talk about her activities as a fur trader. How original is that, being a fur trader? Uh, you can have a listen here. I mean, hear what it takes to uh, to be a fur trader and to um, develop the business in this particular field, having to be mobile and etc. So here goes. Hello, podcast listeners. This is Annabelle from Quifovi and um, Lawfully Creative. It's nice to be back on air. And today this is with Natasha Kohl who is a fur trader working at our own company called Scarlett Rose Finch. So how are you today Natasha? You're just back from Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Just from the auction for eight days. Sale went well and everything okay. Wonderful. You've been living in the UK for a long time. Yes, yeah, since 1994. And did you always practice your trade out of Europe or did you also practice your trade in the US or in, in, in Russia? Uh, the, my main trade is in Russia and Ukraine. I have one customer in Argentina and one customer in Poland. All the rest of the trade is in Russia and Ukraine. How interesting. So basically most of your customers are not European-based mm -hmm. apart from Poland. Mm -hmm. Russia mainly. Mm -hmm. And wh why is that? So is, don't they have some nice phones over there? They have nice fairs, but the majority of nice fairs produced in Europe or America. Aha! This is why we... Okay, China is out of the picture. They do fur, but it's terrible. Uh, yeah. China is not. They, they don't have good quality yet. So do you want to describe a little bit the process that you went through when you were in this, during those eight days in Copenhagen or in Scandinavia? To, did you visit some farms? Did you... No, it's an auction which going from morning till night and we had uh, six and a half million mink. And some other fur. Six and a half million minks. Yes, this time. Is uh, that a lot? It's a lot. Yeah, sounds like it. Next time they promise eight million mink, which is even more. Are they being bred in France? Yes, okay. in, in, in Denmark mainly. Denmark is the biggest production, produ production in the world almost. Of everything or of mink? No, of mink. Oh, right. And then chinchilla, you said? Chinchilla is also produced a good, very, very good quality, the best in the world chinchilla in Copenhagen, in uh, Denmark, generally. Okay. What about um, fox? Where do you usually find foxes? Foxes uh, in, in Helsinki and they're produced in Sweden and Norway. Helsinki, Sweden and Norway. Well, in a way it's quite reassuring to hear that it's mostly the Scandinavian countries which are the main producers of fur. Uh, uh, yeah. In a way it's quite reassuring, it's all this very, you know, not laid back but efficient and caring Scandinavian countries which deal into this fur trade because I suppose that their practices are really top-notch in terms of caring for the animals. Yes, they have new organization, in fact it's called welfare 
which is a new organization, which is uh, based on uh, only one thing, to look after animal well-being. This is very strict. It's very strict. The, each farm will be inspected three times a year, and then every year after this, if they give civic certification, uh, once a year, just to, wow. to keep an eye. And this is uh, coming to effect this uh, this winter. Uh, so I think this is a very good move from the industry. And who set it up? Is it like a trade body? Or? This is uh, three auctions set it up. Okay. It's Copenhagen Fair. It's a Saga. Saga and Nafa. Fair. It's three auctions yeah. set it up. And from next year, it will be no uncertified fair at the auction at all. All farm will be sold at this three auction will be certified by this organization. That's a great move. It's yeah. a lot of... I suppose it's mainly women who wear fur, to be fairly honest. And a lot of women, especially in the UK or the US, were like, oh, I'm not going to wear fur because I'm concerned um, that it's not being ethically raised. reduced, raised and killed. No, no, it is, so it's, it's not possible. This is great. You know, we, we, are, we have so many, so many <laughs> restrictions and so many certifications for mink farming really? and for fox farming. Okay. Uh, that it's not possible to produce not, you know, first of all, if you not produce, if you not keep animals well, it's not going to be a nice fair, so you're cutting your own throat anyway. So you have, to, you have to keep them in a good conditions and plus... It's a long-term plan, yeah. Yeah, and also, you, as you said, lots of lots of customers today inquire how these animals have been bred. We don't want to buy a fair which is not properly been raised. They see few a few shots from China, which is terrible. We don't do this. Yeah, we don't I've have. Seen, I've this. seen some videos from America. This as is well. terrible. So yeah. this is. I think this is. This is very good organization to keep. It's on track. You can keep this. Thank you. This, uh, this welfare. Thank you very much, Natasha. So this is. Uh, this is something which we all involved trade auctions and consumers and retailers as well because they they great, will great participate in this. As well, seems to be under the auspices of European for Europe, probably. Yeah, exactly. EU standards, well, welfare quality. It's yeah. well. really cool. And so you said that um, sometimes you also go to America for. Yes. You go auctions. to Canada. In Canada, they have very big auction, which they have wild fur as well, not wild raised fur. It's about twenty percent of all fur is wild fur. All the rest is farm farm fur. Okay. But if this is also very ha heavily regulated, and we have it for rare animals or skins, we have CITES, which is international organization which look after you know the amount of skins you can take. Uh, what's it called again? CITES. CITES office. It's in every country. It's okay. international, and they regulate how many skins you can take. For okay. example, lynx cat, you can't take as many as, as you want. You have to take a certain quantity, and this is regulated with the sizes. Every skin has a tag and a number. You can uh -huh. check the sizes office whether they're allowed or not. So we're not dealing with skins which are not, nobody going to touch that. So just to um, just to clarify this point, when you go, to, for example, to Canada to an uh, auction mm -hmm. and you buy some fur there, do you have to travel back on the plane with your sighters? No, it goes with the goods. Oh, it goes with goods. It doesn't travel with you in flight. Mm. No, okay. Is so it travel on cargo goods. or? Yeah. Well, is it on the on a flight or is it by by sea? No, it's usually on the plane. On the plane, okay. So it's quicker. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. And so, okay. So you just put it in the depot on the, on the uh, at the airport and auction people. Do. Auction people. Okay. With shipping your agent, shipping agent does this. And every single shipment certified by the CITES and accompanied by CITES. Without CITES, we cannot touch the goods. It's all legal. Of course. If this is rare fur, but yeah. some of the wild fur, like raccoon, for example, it's just so many of them. Okay. It's not. It's not on the street. Okay. Really? Yeah. I see what you mean. It's not going to be instinct. No. And. Um, so going back to Canada, for example, where you say that part of it is, is wild fur, Canada, I know, is also super protective of you know minorities and, and also they protect nature, etc. So do they sort of audit and keep a trail of how many animals are being caught and, and, um, yes. and, and, yeah, and to make sure that they are... So they, give this, they give this number in advance. They know how many lynx cut or lynx you can take or otter you can take from the wild fur. Okay. And they give you... 
num to the to the hunters who hunt this uh, okay. the things. Okay. They give number how many license how many you can. I see. You can hunt. within your license. They they give license to people who, who go to the forest. Yeah, yeah I get it. And in the license, they, have, they yeah. do have to respect a certain quota. Yes. It's Nobody can hunt without license in Canada. Yeah, sure. And, and if you're oh, America, yeah. and you can't you can't basically kill um, uh, animals over the quota, otherwise you will get you know fined mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. good prison. Wow, so not be able to crazy. sell them because without without sure. without, sight is, without sight is you're not gonna, you're not going to do anything. Of course, you're not going all to do all these animals, which is it's a have a sightist list. Uh, they have to accompany every ship, shipment by sightist document and by yellow tag, which is the number on every skin. So it's very strict. Yeah, it is very strict. Very strict. I, I remember I did a I went to the fashion law boot camp back in May 2014 in Fordham School of Law in New York. These two weeks boot camp, as it was called, was really for me the trigger to after which I decided to found my firm, focusing on fashion and fashion law, etc., luxury. And I remember we had one session on fur trade. And at the time, so that, as I said, oh, 2012, sorry, I was in 2012, May 2012. And at the time, I was under the impression, I mean, at least the message conveyed by Susan Scafidi, the teacher, the professor there, was that it was fairly unregulated as a trade, especially in the US and China. So what is your view on this? Do you think that... China is definitely unregulated. Okay, totally unregulated. Europe is very regulated by European standards of okay. everything. You just saw my brochure, it's yes. all European. Yes. <laughs> European regulation, Fantastic. which is very strict. Fantastic. America is regulated by few organizations, like Fair Breeders Association and few other things. And as I said, it's regulated by CITES office, which look after animals, which is not allowed to take more than you want. So uh, on, on my... Which one, sorry? The site is office. Yes. They regulate the quantity of skins you can take from okay. the wild. Yes. And all the rest of the animals, which is not site, is like for example raccoon. It's so many of them. It's just it's not. It's not like instinct and There's no need to be regulated. Okay. It's so it's too many. Yeah, so I think at the moment it's very well regulated a trade. Yeah. It's it's no problem of welfare of the animals anywhere except China. Yeah. China is a special country. Yeah. We don't we don't deal with Chinese fur. We don't buy or sell or don't do anything with Chinese fur. I think majority of fur produced in China mm -hmm. goes for from for domestic market, or some goes to Russia. There's only two countries. I don't know where where else is. I, I wonder in any case what sort of. Animals do? Could they breed there, or could they? So they have big mink production. They used to be. They used to. They used to have very big mink production, and then have been reduced in the last few years because the prices were very low, and of course the small that's short. The they don't make any margins anymore. They don't make any money, so they they yeah. just don't get rid of it. Yeah. But this year the prices are stabilized, okay. and we expect some sort of Chinese mink to come on the market. Yes, again. Yeah, but not on our market. We don't deal with yeah, yeah, I got, I got it's, that, yeah. It goes on the internal market and they manufacture garment from the, the own mink, the mink production. And I think majority goes to, to Russia. I, I was wondering, you, you just mentioned the issue of price. And I was wondering whether all these regulations, and, which are a demand from the customer at the end, at the end of the day, because they want to know what the supply chain is like and whether the animals are being treated fairly. But do you think that as a consequence, there's been an increase in the price of the uh, commodities of the fur as a prime material? Not really. The, no. the price of, uh, of, of this special welfare regulation it increased, but it, it's it's very inferior to, to compare to mink court, say, okay. because we pay as a customer for the auction for this for this new organization. We pay ten euro cents per skin. That's welfare. Welfare. Yeah. Welfare. Yeah, welfare. Okay. We pay ten cents per skin from this year. That's not. This is new. It's yeah. very little. But if you want to have a special label when it says it's all certified, okay, this is it's like two euro per garment. It's very little. It's, it's worth it. It's very very yeah, little. I it's so I think it's inferior cost yeah. to uh, to this uh, to openness of this trade because lots of people think they are torture animal, which is wrong, which is not which is not correct. 
and animals live in terrible conditions. I don't conditions. really see the Scandinavians torturing animals. No. It's not really my no. thing, and this is how we can prove to the consumer yeah. that everything open. They can go to these organizations, they can have a look at the, at the reports on every farm in yeah. Denmark, in Finland, in Sweden, and everywhere. They can have a look because this is this is independent organization. Sure, sure, sure. Doesn't belong to any yeah. neither farmers or auctions or anything. Yeah, they aren't. Under so the, it's completely open organization which consumer, if they want, they want to check every farm good. and have a look how how the animal been kept. I think a really good and and uh, constructive evolution for fair trade, because uh, again, uh, coming back to this experience of Holland School of Law, I mean, the, uh, Miss Kedifidi, the professor there, showed us one or two videos and was like, oh my god, I was faint fainting, you know, out of my chair. And it, this was not the impression that I had about the furs, you know, because for me, the fur is very also emotional. My my mum my bought me my, my first fur coat when I think I turned 18 or something, which I still have, I still wear it. And also I eat meat. So I didn't really see the ethical problem in, in buying fur, and I still do. I buy leather, I buy, I buy fur, and I love it and, uh, because it's a natural product and it's very beautiful. But I, I am under the impression that Anglo-Saxons, in particular, in, uh, I'd say the UK or the US, they're a bit more reluctant, a bit more reluctant to, 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 um, to these sort of products and with people. Pita and stuff. What is your view on this? Do you feel that in the in the world there are certain central markets or actual markets which are more biased uh, against fur? Actually, UK never been biased. If you have a look at the uh, old lady, older lady in this country, they all have two or three Meat. fur coat tucked somewhere there in the cupboard. So it uh, was here, it yeah. was fashionable. Also, yeah. Italy, people still wear it. You know, the people who bought it before, it's still very fashionable. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they don't buy it now, some. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, I think Peter did an extremely good job here to brainwash people okay. for all these years mm -hmm. that the fair is bad and fair is not loud and everything else. But I never see anybody in the UK throwing red paint on a, on a steak eaters. Because on it's what? on the steak eaters, because it's exactly the same. To raise a cow and raise a mink mm. is the same thing. It's a farm business, yeah. it's a highly regulated boss, and steak is allowed, but mink is not allowed. It doesn't matter it goes for skin and cows goes for meat. The principle is the same. Yeah. It's it's farming yeah. methods which which we farm to use product for, for the for the for the consumer. Yeah, as we say in French, you are preaching to a converted person already because I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, but I, I have noticed this like this sort of political reaction almost to yes, fur trade uh, in this. certain countries. Well, in France, okay, we totally call cool about it. In my, as I said, in my family, I've been accustomed to wearing leather and fur from a very young age. And, um, and I love it, honestly. So, yeah. I think in the UK, this is a very easy target for business because it's, we have very little voice and we have very little, little political, you know, political grips. Right. So, the easiest thing to do have been banned. Mink farm have been banned from UK. Banned? Yes. You cannot raise a mink anymore. But this is. This is a, it didn't achieve anything because people lose job, you know. This, yeah. But you can buy steel mink in other countries. It's not like it's have been improvement on this on this account anyway. But I think now uh, now in twenty first century, the, all this bad propaganda about fur, a little bit forgotten. Petra yeah. had lots of problem and so themselves, yes. and they kind of let it go a little bit. And I think fashion wise, it's yeah. coming back. Absolutely. Totally. And also, nobody wants to wear today in 21st century huge, rigid fur coat in black and brown like it used to be. Yeah. People want something fashionable, and yeah. this is what it is. It's yeah. not fur business anymore. It's yeah. fashion business. True. This is where we will strive in, yeah. in, in the West. Well, they knit the fur so that it's like I saw some Fendi coats that were amazing. They were just knitting bits by bits of the fur, and it was just all super, I mean, it was so flexible, so fluid, beautiful. Um, Yes, this is a different technique also. Charles Lagerfeld was, uh, went on the record saying that he doesn't do fur for Chanel because the quality of the furs in France is just not high enough. 
But for Fendi, um, you would do leather products and uh, fur products for Fendi in Italy because the quality of the leather and the fur is much better over there. So that's, that was quite interesting, his point of view, that this is why there aren't many fur products at Chanel. I just wanted to come back to um, the uh, sort of logistics of your business because it's not like my business, you know, where it's all in my brain and perhaps a few legal books and a laptop and a phone and me being on the move all the time between Paris, London and South France and the US. You need a warehouse, right? You need to actually, when you go to these uh, auctions, you buy some, some stock and then you need to store it somewhere. So how do you... I usually buy for clients. So basically it's shipped from the auction directly to the client? You don't have you don't have a stock in place somewhere? No, I don't have. I don't know. It's usually I buy as a fair broker. I buy... You're an agent? For, yeah, like a broker. I buy for the client. And then goods need to be processed in the dressing factory. I ship them to the dressing factory. I see. And after the dressing factory, I ship to my client directly. So I never see the fair. Yes, that's true. So it we ship it to a dressing factory? Yes. What does that mean? Sorry. The dressing, the, all the fair sold at the auction is raw. You know, it's like a, a not, not soft. Mm -hmm. So the, in order to, to manufacture in the garments or, yeah. or any, any fair pieces, you need to dress the fair. You need to process them to I make see. them. Nice How do you dress them? You put this is in this is a dressing, dressing factory uh, which is uh, uh, which is uh, doing this, and uh, this is this uh, this is very long process. You put them in the water and then you flash them. Really? Skin it. Yes, it is. All of them, all of the furs are treated like all this. Fair, yes. all Otherwise, they're just too raw yes. yeah. uh, uh, yes. Is it to soften the skin, which is? Behind. This is a big difference between raw skins, which we see in the auction. It's yeah. Like, so yeah. They're Flat rigid. And yes. rigid. Uh, and this is a big difference between dress skins, which is nice and soft and ready for, for the manufacturer the to manufacturer. produce. Wonderful. And so how long does that take, this dressing process, usually? It depends how, factory, how, how this factory is busy. Usually two, three weeks. Oh, so that's quite quick. Yeah. That's quite quick, I think. If they're busy, it could be four weeks. It depends. You're almost like a logistical agent as well, because then you have to make sure that the, the furs are, are actually <laughs> yeah, the furs are ready, yeah. and then you have to ship them to the clients. So in Russia, yes. Argentina, Poland. sorry, and Poland. Yeah. Okay. In terms of logistics, you've got to take care about um, the insurance, the, the the transport, making sure that all the costs of transport are very well. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it's a big job on itself. I'm, I'm sure it is because uh, some people don't do it as a broker; they just buy skins, and customer have to deal themselves with all this problem, but it's my bang. company does the whole service, of course. Uh, you know, the, the, everything we do, because it's taking, it's very time consuming, but this is service which I provide, which I, I think it's very good to have. My customer never remember what they've got, so always, <laughs> Natasha, where is my 1,257 skins? I'm just uh, all in my head. Really? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, of course, so they're we, we, really happy to delegate all the just logistics and the process of preparing the skin for the uh, dressing to you. And so, I suppose, like in fashion, there are cycles. For example, you know, the fashion week happens in Paris and the rest of the big fashion capitals like twice a year for women and twice a year for men. Are there also some cycles in the uh, fur trade auctions? Yes, all, a season starts in December. Okay. First options we have in December in Saga in Helsinki, and then we Saga is one of the main Saga fair. one of the auction yes it's okay. in, in, in Helsinki. Okay. Then we go to Copenhagen, and then we have five auctions in Copenhagen a year, four auctions in Saga in Helsinki, and three or four auctions in Nafa, and two auctions in American Legend in America. Where about in America? In uh, in Seattle. In Seattle, in Washington. D. Okay, and um, um, two, two or three auctions in St. Petersburg for sable exclusively, only sable. Russian sable. Okay, so basically it's all year round. Yes, I saw you. So you're always busy. Always busy. I haven't been in in where on the dry land since January. <laughs> You haven't been on dry land? What do you mean by that? I mean, I've been traveling all the time. Also, we have fair, big okay. trade fairs. We have trade fair in Hong Kong. And a big tra trade fair in Milan, so this you know combination of auctions. So, so, okay, so this, okay, there are three auctions which you just mentioned in Saint Petersburg, in uh, Seattle, in Helsinki, and also I think of course uh, uh, Copenhagen. And then you said that the, okay, so these are commercial trade, professional trade fairs. Yes. Do you mind explaining to us how that works? Yes, it's all manufacturers who produce 
garments or other pieces uh, they have big fair in Hong Kong it's mainly Chinese uh, production from Hong Kong also some Chinese some, also some foreigners and also in Milano we have uh, mainly uh, European producers who uh-huh. produce garments so they just it's just like an open plan and they just show they have all have booths yeah they show, they show they dressed skins not the skins the garments Oh, look, oh, right, okay, after they've been uh, manufactured with yes. some fur products yes. from the dressed skins. Amazing. That's interesting. And so, who buys this? Is it the brands or the fashion brands? It's or? a retailer's boat. Okay. But are these, are these products, these manufactured... Jackets, coats, everything. Yeah, are they, are, are, they, are they made for particular brands in mind? or The biggest brand we have is Gian, Gianfranco Ferret. Franco Ferret, really? Yes. Is still big, that guy? They have at this fair, yes. They have his own uh, production. The retailers come uh, to this fair and really? order, yes, and order designs, whatever they like. So this is the biggest brand we have. We have right. a few others who are famous in our business. Okay. In Sables, and I, I don't think everybody knows them. In terms of the fashion and luxury world, which brands do you think, according to you, Natasha, are the most Technically and aesthetically expert at producing, manufacturing top garments. Uh, the Fendi is very good at Ferret. Fendi is fantastic. Very good. Really. Ferret is very good. Gianfranco Ferret. Yeah. But I thought that guy, it's, it's, I'm sorry to say that, I mean, it, I don't want to be rude, but I thought actually he had, this company got winded up. I thought it was liquidated. No. No, Gianfranco Ferret is okay. Yes. Yes. So they've probably been bought by somebody else. Mm. So they, they have a, a very, very strong fur product. Yes. Like, well, I love very good. Uh, yeah, Italian produces for them yeah. very good manufacturers. Yeah. Uh, all produ- uh, production done in Italy. In Italy, right. So they just buy the furs and they get all the production in Italy. Yes. Okay. Yes, and it's very good quality and the designs are also amazing. Yeah, yeah. Fendi, I do agree with you, they're fantastic in fur. And uh, so I, I actually met. Uh, you, Natasha, through Oksana. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce her surname because it's a bit difficult. Maybe. Krustakutska. Yes, thank you. But <laughs> that's the Oksana I know. And she's basically one of the co directors of um, Furland, the uh, wonderfully ex- exquisite fur brand based out of uh, Moscow. And that brings me to my next question, which is do you think that also Russian brands are strong in manufacturing fur products? On well, my personal opinion, her brand, this Furland, is the best it's in beautiful. head. And the small accessories. The craftsmanship is is the second to none. Yeah, it's not it. better. She makes this beautiful, adorable gilet, like little, you know, with waistcoat, a, yeah. a waistcoat without any, any sleeves. Oh my god, it's so beautiful. Yeah. For some sort of Russian traditional embroidery. Embroideries. Oh. Yeah, it's very it's exclusive, it's very nice. Yes. Whatever they produce, I think they're the best company in this yes. in the world. I see many designs. Yes, I think so. Okay. In the small pieces, it's the best. And also hats. Nobody has so many models of hats. And Oksana is designer for this. Is so. she? Is she? Ah, okay, so she's not a she commercial is. director. She's, she's commercial, commercial director and designing now. Right. This, is, this is, as you can imagine, it's it's very sort of hands-on process. Yes. Because you have to over, oversee everything. Every and single stitch needs to be overseen. Every single garment needs to be overlooked because it's just, you know, it's... It, the quality needs to be there. Did we're doing something there. now in London also. Sorry? So we're doing something in London as well. What so we're opening a new brand in London. Oksana and you? Oksana and me. Oh, how yes. wonderful. When? How? Tell us. <laughs> if uh, you can, of course. If I can. I can tell you a little bit. Okay. Uh, the brand, we have a name. It's called Scarlet London. Ah. Uh, this is new. And uh, when? Uh, this is a good question. <laughs> But quite soon, so you definitely will be invited for the opening of the oh, brand. Be so fabulous, wonderful! Yes. So you want to you want to be more in, in, in involved in the retail side. Of yes, e tail, e tail. Yes, okay. internet sales. Right. What for you? For players like Netporte and not the... their own website. Okay. We would have to we have to do lots of promotion. <laughs> Yeah, this is something something completely different. Yeah, but it's a great idea. It's a great, great idea. Wonderful. We try. You want to sell all over the world? Yes. Fantastic. And London is based very well for, for people to buy because it's yeah. easy access well, to everything. Much sure. easier than out of Moscow. 
Fair enough, yes, probably. Is, yeah, I agree with you. Although we don't really know what's going to happen with Brexit, but I agree with you. But uh, even in terms of uh, hours, you know, because of the Greenwich Marine and Time, it's so easy to work with Asia. And all the international shipments is not a problem at all. Right, right, right. Okay, well, just cool. use GHL or yeah. GT, that's not a problem. Okay. Okay, well, congratulations, that's lovely. Thank you. When is the opening, uh, more or less, time was Oh, we don't know yet. Okay. We're working on it. We have already products in London. We have the name, which is most important. We have website and all this is not operational yet. But this is something coming. I'm really excited for you guys. Fantastic. Do you mind just kindly explain to us how your interest into this fur trade came out? I mean... uh, it's a very niche sector, a very specific sector, and as I mentioned before, it's also been tarnished by quite a lot of um, uh, bad press, so to speak. So, how did you how did you fall uh, did you fall in love with that particular sector? Well, I didn't fall in love. I just somebody introduced me to to this sector. Okay. And when I started, I started in 1998. I didn't know much about fur. Uh, this have been many years since 1998. 19 years I'm in the trade. My. I learned about uh, trade with my customers, with my Russian customers together. Okay. Because neither my customers or no me didn't know anything about fur. <laughs> I have very very strict trading. We we work long long hours mm. uh, in order to understand fur. It's not rocket science, but you need a long time. Uh, we think you need 10 years to train somebody if you want a specialist in fair. It's like sushi chef. It's a long time. It's so many specifics. You cannot remember it straight away. So you need to, by looking, by touching fair, uh-huh. this is how you learn. The different quality, different shades, and different colors. It's a taking a long time. So after 10 years, you finally... <laughs> Anybody who learned it uh, is going to be a good specialist. It doesn't go immediately, like in, in six months, not going, not going to happen. I didn't think that you need to really develop a body of skills and become so specialized. Yes. To with, uh, yeah, I probably it's because you want to make sure you, you just buy the best product. Yes, we, may, we need to make sure for our clients that we know the product very well. In, to know the product, you need to learn about the product, and it takes a long time because every fair is specific. Mink has their own, uh, own specification and fox has a different specification, wild have different specification. So you need to learn at every fair what it is and what it shouldn't be. And, you know, there's a, there's a big volume of, of learning needs to be done if you want to be good. Well, how and when and why did you decide to set up your own operation after a few years? Where, where was the uh, well, That was in uh, 2013, so it's yeah. uh, three and a half years now. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think this has happened. I was very successful in uh, working for the company. We did very good business. Mm. But you yeah, company. Uh, I company. I work for the company for the same uh, for the for the same business in the oh. English company. Okay. But if, you know, when you are more or less independent already, working for somebody else, mm-hmm. and when you have your new ideas, what you want to do. It's not always shared with you. Your bosses, maybe they don't want to do it. Maybe they told to do it. Maybe they have something else in mind. So every time, all my proposals never come to anything. Oh. And I decided if I want to do something, like I want to do Scarlet London now, yes. I can do it. You yeah, know, I know it's a decision maker. I am decision maker. I have also very good support support group, which supported me in everything I do. Good for you. <laughs> Very good people work for me. <laughs> uh, what do you mean in terms of your accountant, your web designer? My web designer, my accountants, and of course we have to process all the invoices for customers. Okay. We have to do all the buying lists, all this set up on the, on the internet. Yeah. So if you want to do something, if you have any ideas, this is the best thing to do if you yeah. have your own company. Of course this is a big risk and a lots of work. <laughs> It doesn't happen automatically. You only have two heads, and everything uh-huh. needs to be done. You know, probably. Sorry. So, this is this is how I come to the conclusion that in order for me to do it, I probably have to do it on my own. Mm-hmm. And I was probably right because whatever I think to do, if I want to do this, I can do it. And did you actually have to sort of start from scratch in 2013? Did you have to build your client base again or did you manage to have... lots of clients came with me because wow. we start together in 1998 and majority of clients remained with me like this is why like 
like Fela and like few, few like all others, um, because they always felt we have very good connection and very good relationship. That's fantastic. Well done. And I am highly professional person uh -huh. who, who doing. They, sure. they can see it. Customer can see it. Yeah. What I know, I have catalog done. This is big book at the auction. They can see everything. You know, and also not full. Mm -hmm. And this is why they stay with me. Did you manage to grow your roster of clients over the years? Or? I have few new clients, Good. but unfortunately, the business in Russia is not going up; mm. it's reducing because of the trade sanctions. No, because yes, because of the sanctions first, and because of disposable income. Russia is not getting richer. Is it not? No. It's well, to be fair, this was a large portion of Americans as well who are not getting richer. So. I mean, in Europe, probably also nobody gets rich. <laughs> it's a difficult time for everybody. I guess, I guess you might be right. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Do you think it's going to stay like this for a long time? Because the growth prospects are quite good in Europe, in America. What, in Russia, it, in Russia, what's it like? In Russia, everything depends on oil, oil price. On the what? Oil price. Okay. Russia is a huge oil producer. Okay. And this is how. What this is the only commodity, oil and gas, what they live off. If they, if prices go up, That's the good. economy of Russia going up and yes. disposable income in, in the pocket, which they can spend on, on the fur, going up also. So this will be good for everybody. That's interesting. So it's a bit like in the Middle East where they were so highly reliable on, uh, on oil and gas, probably yes, more oil and gas actually. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. So this is, the, we just have to hope everything is sta stabilizing. Few last years, all the big brands were relying on, on Chinese revival of, yes. of, of buying, buying, buying. Yeah. I think Chinese have been buying for a few years and they think they don't want to buy as much as before. Sure. <laughs> and also some sort of little bit of crisis coming in China as well. Yeah. We also see it in our, in our industry, we, our prices decrease threefold for the fair. For the used fair trade? To, yes. Because it's we decreased threefold. Yes, because we used to have a, a average price for the mink hundred and twenty dollars, it's gone down to forty dollars. How can you survive? This is very difficult. We have been going through the very difficult time it's a, in the fair trade. And this is uh, this is all all down to Chinese because Chinese consumption is not as good as before. Yeah. There's been a crackdown on the um, the massive expenses which uh, I mean, the Chinese and government. expenses in smuggling and all this, uh, you know, this is uh, you see in an in in industry. Yeah, yeah I've, I, I think the Chinese officials and the Chinese government have tried to crack down on, on all these Chinese going and buying some some gifts and very low expense. Watches, yes, yes, exactly, to yes. work for their friends or you know to get some business done. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been a definite crackdown. Wow, okay, so fashion brands are basically <laughs> starving to death or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, in a way, it's, it's very your buyers so first. In a way, it's quite good if, for them if the prices have gone down because they can buy them. Yes, it's much better for my Russian client because finally we can afford to buy fur at the normal prices. I see. So this is a very, it was very difficult when prices going up every auction and mm -hmm. the prices reached such a levels we've never seen before. I see, so for you, in a way, it's doesn't really matter too much because you are representing the buyers of all this fur. Yes. Yeah. So in yeah, in any case for you, it's quite okay. It's more for the auctioneers and the people who actually go and and produce the furs. Uh, who are for suffering. the farms, for the farms, the farmers, it's very difficult. And the and the uh, the hunters who are hunting the wild. Hmm. Yes, it was very difficult, very tough few years, but I think uh, the price is stabilized now at the level which is acceptable for everybody. Mm -hmm. Farms can survive, not make much money, yeah. but that will be sustainable. I heard that a lot of Scandinavian farmers actually, they have a double activity. They, they do the farming of the, um, of the various pro uh, animals on one hand, but on the other hand they have some additional income coming from other activities. Is that something that you've noticed when you go to mm -hmm. Scandinavia? No. Usually they are full-time employed in their operations. Oh no, yes, you're right. They're doing a part-time job. And That's right. Yes. It's part-time, yeah, because everything is automized, so it's not like yes, they, they, do, they don't need. Seven. They just need to feed mink twice a day. Yeah. They do it in the morning before their main job. Right. And then come back. Lots of farms in Denmark, right. family, run, family run small farms. Yes, yes. And this is like additional income. Indeed. And they like it. It's a hobby. 
Right, which is also make money for them on a good year. Okay, I see. Uh, uh, in a way, they hedge, they hedge their bets because they, this is not their main source of income anyway. They, yes. they have another job. Lots of lots of farms. It's it's, uh, yes, lots of farms in, in Denmark runs like this. Yeah. It's a family small business. Yeah, so what I heard was right. Okay. Yes. How do you see this evolving? I mean, do you think that there is still quite a good future for the fur business in for, for fashion luxury products or? You think that, I don't know, maybe with the new type of materials which are coming up in the market, like um, Internet of Things or uh, garments which are connected to your body or to your devices, do you, do you think that, um, or, or even to your emotions, do you think that, that the fur trade may um, suffer from this or do you, see, do you think there's a good future ahead? I think in some of, the, some of the areas of the world, like for example in Russia, in London is not necessary. People would wear fur because they want to wear fur. Sure. In some of the parts of Russia, you need to wear fur because it's very cold. Very cold. <laughs> so this is, okay. this is another thing which, which, which Russians like fur uh -huh. because of the weather. Because it's a huge factor for us. Yeah. If it's cold weather, the, our sales are very good. Uh -huh. If it's warm winter, we don't have sales. If our sales drop dramatically. So we totally depends on weather as well as everything else. So it's one of the industry which is very strange, but we do depends on this. But I used to live in Irkutsk for one year, and in the winter we have temperature minus 45, minus 40, and it's nothing would save you from this temperature except fur. fur. Is it, where is it? Kutsk. Irkutsk. Irkutsk. It's in Siberia. It's minus very cold. 40. Minus Irkutsk. 40, minus 45 in the winter. And this is this is a uh, last for a long time since no, uh, from November until could be March or oh. April now. Right. So you really need the fur coat for I this see. for these conditions. Uh -huh, yeah. As I said, if for some region in London you don't need no, it it's because it's the weather yeah. is more for fashion. The weather you you don't need it. You need a parka and that's all you need. But in some of the part of the world, this is why when some people said you don't need to wear fur, they probably never been in Irkutsk, never <laughs> experienced this weather, which they think you can get away with little, you know, like a fabric coat, you know, you can't, you'll die, literally die, you freeze to death. This is why in Russia people fully realize it's, it's a big area, which is very cold climate on the east of country. All Siberia, so they do. Fortunately, they do need to wear fur, so we will be all right. So, are you saying that fur is uh, is warmer than any thermal product, for example, from uh, you know uh, the North Face or? Yes, of course, it's warmer. It's warmer. Yes, you can wear a fur coat and be very comfortable and warm at very low temperatures. Okay. So, yes. It's amazing, yeah. And you you do need it. You it's do need natural. it. It's an all natural. So you don't think there are any other materials which are as warm as fur as of today? I think this is in you know, the Arctic parkas when they have uh, okay. Okay. Uh, feathers inside. Yeah, yeah. The down. Oh, feathers. Yeah, like yes. uh, uh, goose. Uh, goose goose down. Yes. It's probably also very warm, mm -hmm. but um, you know, it's so it's also not. It's not strictly speaking the warmness of this. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, desirability of, of fur in Russia is still very high. So women in of Russia yes. they want to wear fur. Yes, fortunately yes, yes. for us. Yes. So yes. In this, in the West, people don't want to wear fur anymore. In I Russia, don't. ladies want to wear fur. Sure. So sure. this is it's very good for us. Well, you seem to be really passionate about your job, doing quite well. I wouldn't say booming because of what you said about the increase in prices and stuff. So, um, but I, 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 wish you, I wish you luck in finding some new clients. Do you know where potentially some people would be, would be more susceptible of becoming your, your clients? Which part of the world would you I think prospect? The, this low prices of, of a mink, mink production created this situation when the farm cannot carry on anymore, including right. farms in, in in Russia. Okay. So I think we're going to have more manufacturers in Russia who manufacture inside the country uh -huh. from Western Fair. And this is I think manufacturers is my next step in in finding clients in Russia.
manufacturers of uh, products. Yes. Because my main like goal... Italy, like they're doing it even now that yes. in Russia. Yes. I, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be absolutely delightful what they do. I mean, when I look at the quality of the final products, I'm like, oh, flabbergasted. So it might be very interesting. Russian great, production, the quality is very good. I'm sure. They either don't manufacture it all or manufactured to high standards. Yeah. It's not like Chinese production. You no, know, I don't know whether you, you, you were aware of this, but in on the streetwear side of things, streetwear, um, there are some brands at the moment which are Russian and are, they are really coming quite strong, such as um, the guy who is the creative director of Balenciaga, so Donna, I um, can't remember his surname, but his creative, his brand is Vetement. And I don't think he's Russian per se, but I think he was educated and he grew up in, in Russia. <laughs> I think so, yes. Uh, Domna something. And then there is another guy called Gor Gor Gorichki, Gora Gorichki. Russian brands are doing really well in the, um, in the streetwear segment. And they have a lot of style. So uh, I look forward to that, to this evolution, more and more on the creative process uh, with more Russian products. It would be, it would be quite interesting. And also, to a degree, it will uh, diminish the dependency that they have on oil and gas. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Which, frankly, is not going to go on forever, as we all know. No, yeah. it's probably an alternative source of energy already been exploited everywhere. Hopefully. <laughs> Which we don't know. Hopefully. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Natasha, you you're welcome. wonderful and extremely insightful. Thank you. Do you want to mention perhaps your website um, of Scarlet Rose Finch, is it? Yes, it's very simple, www.scarletrosefinch.com. Okay. Uh, the all information is there and all contacts is there. So if somebody would like to come to the auction or have a look at dressing factory, it's actually in Paris or Milan, so you don't have to go far. Really? Yes. So, the dressing factory? Yes. Wow. One in Paris, one in Milan. And uh, we can arrange this. I volunteer. <laughs> Anytime. You're very welcome. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, produced by Crifovi Studios. Subscribe to our podcast or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube and SoundCloud.